Madam Chair, before we get started, since this is the first time, at least in a while, that most people are here in person, I just wanted to do a quick housekeeping. Um, to my left, your right, um, there are the restrooms. Can you spotlight the chair, please? There are the restrooms. And then to the left of that, we do have our um, break room. And there's coffee, there's water in the middle drawer, and there's refreshments that you can help yourselves to. I forgot that was off. And then um, also on the microphones, when you hit the button on the base and the top is red, it means that they can hear you virtually. And um, we have a quorum present in person. So when you're ready to get started. Great, thank you. It's nice to be back and see everybody in person. Um, let's call to order the July 8th, 2021 meeting of the TPA's Bicycle Trailways Pedestrian Advisory Committee. The Palm Beach TPA is conducting this meeting both in person and virtually using the Zoom webinar platform instruction to join the virtual meeting as well as contact information for assistance are provided in the published meeting agenda. Um, Margie, will you please call the roll so that we can establish a quorum? Yes, ma'am. At this time, I'm only asking those BTPAC members attending in person to respond by saying here when I call your name. I want to remind you to unmute your microphones by putting the pu pushing the button on the base. And if you are here on behalf of a representative, please state so when I call their name. Tracy Phelps. Here. Bruce Rosenzweig. Here. Craig Pinder. Ted Goodenough. Joanna Peluso. Here. Joanne Scaria. Here. Fadi Nassar. Here. Sally Channon. David Willock. Here. Jean Matthews. Casey Pranken here on behalf of Jean Matthews. Uh, Yash Nagal. Here. Michael Owens. Ryan Harding. Christian Santa, alternate for Brian Harding. John Roach. Here. Larry Wallace is absent. Brian Ruscher. Here. Stephanie Thoburn. Here. We have a quorum in person, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next item are modifications to today's agenda. Are there, staff, are there any modifications to the agenda? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, pursuant to state law, a quorum of the BT PAC must be physically present at the advertised meeting site in order to conduct the meeting and take action as a body. However, the Florida Attorney General has previously opined that so long as a quorum is physically present at the meeting site, additional members may participate remotely provided that they have a significant circumstance that justifies their absence with significant circumstance being reasonably determined by the physically present members. I have a couple members that have provided a brief explanation of the significant circumstance preventing their in-person attendance. I will read these aloud so that the committee may determine if these members will be permitted into the meeting as virtual participants. Please note that voting members approved to participate remotely will be enabled to participate in debate and also that they must vote unless they have documented a conflict of interest on a particular item. So at this time, I have Ted Goodenough, um, who is, uh, Ted is on virtually. Um, he has work commitments that require him to be at the city today and he was unable to attend in person. I also have Michael Owens. The school district is short staff and his presence is required at his office. Are there any members of the board that have any objections to allowing Ted and Michael Owens um, to participate remotely? No. no objections? Okay, so seeing none, these members are approved to participate remotely and um, Margie, will you please note their attendance? I will, Madam Chair. And also for the record, Craig Pender has joined us in person, so I will mark his attendance in the record as well. Great, thank you. Okay, so next item, motion to approve. So minutes from the June 3rd, 2021 um, meeting. Are there any changes to the minutes from the board? Didn't see any, just, no. Do I have a motion to adopt the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes from the previous FITPAC meeting. Okay, that was a motion by Brian. And is there a second? Michael Owen, second. Michael Owen, second. 
All in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion passes. So the next item is general public comments and public comments on agenda items. Um, as a reminder, there are three ways to provide public comment um, for this meeting. Written comments can be submitted online on the website. Uh, verbal comments may be made by a virtual attendee on the Zoom platform using the raise hand feature. And um, you may participate in person um, with the rest of us. So submitting a card, comment card, which is at the welcome table. So are there any general comments that we've received, Margie? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Great. We're moving right along to item number E, which is comments from the board. Um, I don't, I, the only comment I have is where's Valerie? We want to, we want to say, Thank you, Valerie. Valerie Nelson. How how long have you been here, Valerie? She's leaving. If anybody, if you all didn't get the um, the email yesterday, late afternoon, I just wanted to say thank you for all the work um, you've done and wish you well. Thank you so much. I, I've been here for a little over six and a half years at the TPA. So, but well, I'm I'm moving at the end of the month. Um, I'll be here till the end of the month. But I'm moving to Anchorage, Alaska. My my hometown to hopefully make a positive impact there in their planning world. So I will miss you all very much. And I've enjoyed very much my time here. So hopefully cross paths again soon, maybe back in the future. We'll see. Thank you so much and, and good luck to you. And we hope to see you keeping everything cool down here, sending down that Arctic air. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Valerie. Um, does anybody else have anything that any comments? Madam Chair, I do have that Ted has his hand raised. Okay. And then just so that the members in person know, um, because again, it's been a while and I keep forgetting that. If you want to raise your tent cards and it helps uh, both myself and Stephanie see if you have any comments on an item. So uh, Ted, you can go ahead. Oh, and Ted, you're still um, muted. It just takes them a minute to get through the prompts. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Valerie. And I hope you enjoy the cool air up in Anchorage. Uh, I do want to remind the presenters today that not all people can see. If you have a graphic on your presentation, please describe it for those who have visual impairments. That's all. Thanks. Thank you for that reminder up front. That's a good one. Um, okay, anybody else? Anybody else wants to make any comments? Okay, so um, we have the BT PAC liaison report, and Alyssa is going to provide that update. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone here in person, a few of us virtually, but it's still great to see everyone. So the first thing on the liaison report is for George Bush Boulevard public meeting. FDOT is conducting a virtual and in-person public meeting for a TPA funded project on today, this Thursday, um, July 8th. So this evening, um, the virtual meeting will begin at 5 p.m. with registration available online. The link is in the liaison report. Um, the in-person meeting our part of this will begin at 6 p.m. And this is going to be at 434 South Swinton Ave in Delray Beach. The Florida Local Technical Assistance Program or LTAP Center webinar or Center is hosting webinars um, or webinar series throughout the month, month of July. The full calendar of webinars and registration is available on their website, floridaltap.org slash training dash calendar. Again, this is also linked in our liaison report. The July TPA governing board meeting will be held on next Thursday, July 15th at 9 a.m., both in person and virtually. And the agenda packet is posted on our website at palmbeachtpa.org slash board. The turnpike widening from Jupiter to Fort Pierce, uh, uh, there is a hybrid public meeting for that coming up on Thursday, July 22nd at 5.30 um, in person 
in Port St. Lucie and in Stewart, and this is available online. For more information, please visit treasurecoastturnpike.com. The next round of pedestrian and bicycle high visibility funding became available on July 1st. For more information or to apply for this funding, please visit alerttodayflorida.com slash HVE. And the raise grant notice of funding opportunity has been uh, posted. They can be submitted through July 12th, 2021. And these are applications for federal rebuilding American infrastructure with sustainability and equity grants. That's what RAISE stands for. Um, the minimum or maximum grant award is $25 million. More information is available on the website, transportation.gov slash RAISE grants. Um, and that is where all of the application information and details are. I do want to quickly point out that in front of everyone who's here in person, um, there is a fiscal year 21 annual report, which is a very nice document. It is yours to take home. Um, and I do want to point out that we are going to show a brand new video about the TPA. So we are going to transition into that very quickly before moving forward. Are there in, oh, sorry. Palm Beach County is the gateway to the beauty and splendor of South Florida. This world-class county is over 1,900 square miles and the home to nearly 1.5 million people representing 39 municipalities. It features an efficient transportation system for pedestrians, bicycles, buses, trains, cars, planes, and boats. It takes a dynamic and eco-friendly devoted team to plan, prioritize, and fund this system, a team with a vision to execute a safe, efficient, and connected multimodal transportation system. The Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency, or TPA for short, is that and so much more. The governing board is made up of 21 locally elected officials. As an independent agency, the TPA has its own staff and four advisory committees. The TPA has adopted a complete streets policy, ensuring that its projects accommodate transportation users of all ages and abilities. The TPA is also a Vision Zero agency, allocating resources to eliminate traffic-related fatalities and serious injuries. We advance our vision by adopting a funding program that allocates over $600 million annually, including gas taxes at the federal, state, and local levels, toll revenues, license and impact fees, and more. The TPA invests in multimodal transportation projects that help build a better and brighter future. This includes construction of state and local roadways, investing in technology to maximize the efficiency of existing infrastructure, and advancing our transit vision. With $3.4 billion for the Transportation Improvement Program, there is so much more on the horizon for our growing county. We're connecting communities to deliver a better transportation system. But to make it happen, we want to hear from you. Get involved with the Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency. Tell us your priorities from pedestrian and bicycle safety to traffic congestion and everything in between. Visit palmbeachtpa.org to get involved and learn more. That was really a nice video. <laughs> Um, thank you. Gave a good overview. Um, so what's next? Oh, Margie, are there any uh, public comments on the on this item? I have no public comments. Okay. Uh, do we have any committee member comments? No. Ted or Michael hands raised. Okay. So our first action item for today is the fiscal year 2023 to 2027 list of project priorities. And Andrew Euler is the TPA Deputy Director of Program Development, and he's gonna present this to us today. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. So we'll be presenting the list of priority products for fiscal year 2023 to 2027. So if you all were here last month and remember reviewing um, and then the board adopting the 
Transportation Improvement Program for fiscal years 2022 to 2026. This is us already getting started in that process, moving towards next year's fiscal year, so 23 to 27. This is actually a required uh, document to be submitted to FDOT. And so this is really our priorities as a TPA with the funding that we directly oversee, uh, federal and state funds that go towards three different programs. And this is gonna be a joint presentation between our staff for the ones who lead those programs. And I'll start it off. So our mission to collaboratively plan, prioritize and fund the transportation system, focusing here on the prioritization process. And the development of the transportation improvement program really starts uh, a year in advance. And, and you all are familiar with that process when you all uh, are doing your transportation alternatives uh, scoring and rankings. But so it starts with the product development. So products are submitted to us from locals and we work with FDOT and the county to develop projects through our two competitive grant applications and also for products on state roadways. Uh, a lot of those originating from our, our long range transportation plan. So those products that are, are developed are then put into our list of priority projects, which is uh, you all are seeing today. So the state road modifications, uh, local initiatives and transportation alternatives. And then once those are adopted as priorities, those are given to FDOT later this month to start drafting their next work program. And so when they go through that process, they're adding their strategic intermodal system projects, they're adding other O&M projects and other um, products on the state system. And then they're also integrating our priorities as the TPA. So once that's accomplished, uh, they have a draft that is sent to us for the work program. And then we build our transportation improvement program. So that combines all those priorities that we have, FDOT's priorities. And then we also integrate local capital projects uh, from a local capital improvement programs into the TIP to make a more comprehensive transportation uh, work program. There's three main funding uh, categories for us uh, shown in the list of priority products. It's products on state roadways, which is using state funding. It's around $20 million a year. We have local initiatives program, uh, which is around $22 million a year of federal funds. And then we have the transportation alternatives program, which is $3.3 million a year, also from federal funds. The first program that we're gonna have uh, discussed today is our state-run modifications. And that's led by Connor Cambasso from our office and he's gonna present on those. Awesome, thank you, uh, Andrew. And uh, thank you all for having me here today. It's good to see everybody in person. Um, my name is Connor Campobasso. I am the Long Range Transportation Plan Coordinator here at the TPA. And with that, I also manage the State Road Modifications Program. And if you haven't heard of it or you're not familiar with it, that's okay. It's a relatively new program and we're still working to uh, formalize it uh, as best we can. And actually, you'll be hearing a little bit more about that uh, in a presentation later. But the, uh, the purpose of the program is to uh, enhance uh, existing roadways um, as well as uh, modify upcoming uh, state um, projects to achieve the TPA's mission and vision. And that's done through a variety of different types of projects, things like safety improvements, uh, complete streets, transit improvements, technology, um, as well as resiliency. And again, those mainly um, for this program are focused on the state roadway. Now there's about $20 million uh, per year programmed uh, for this, or I should say allocated to this program of state funds. However, if you take a look in the TIP, uh, you'll notice that there's actually quite a bit more uh, being allocated to this program. And that's because we're trying to leverage different funding pots uh, here at the TPA uh, to maximize the program as much as possible. Now for the types of projects, uh, there's, there's really two types of projects that this program focuses on. So there is brand new projects. So projects that didn't exist before that are being proposed to be added to the TIP. Um, and those typically are programmed in the new fifth year of that TIP, so quite a few years out. However, we also are focusing on modifications to existing projects, things like triple R's or resurfacing projects that DOT is conducting uh, that we'd like to add elements to, such as complete streets elements or things like that. And we try to aim to have those, uh, those improvements added to that year's program year. So if it's in the third year for construction, we, we try to add that uh, to that year. Um, that being said, that really depends on funding availability, um, where it's at in the timeline. If it's already been designed, it might be too late, but we try to do our best to get those modifications in 
and to uh, get them in as early as possible. So with that being said, I did want to highlight uh, quite a few of the projects that are being in there uh, that are be, uh, already in the uh, priority list as well as new ones being added in. Now, again, this isn't every project that we have in here. It's quite a long list, um, but these are some of the, the key ones that I wanted to highlight today. And starting off, I wanted to talk about uh, the US-1 corridor. Uh, we did a corridor study in that area and from that uh, came quite a few projects. Um, so in the priority list, we are seeking construction funding for lane repurposing in Boca Raton. Uh, we are seeking uh, design and construction funding for a complete streets project in West Palm Beach. Uh, we are also seeking feasibility funding uh, for a lane repurposing project in Lake Worth. Um, there is one project being removed on the US-1 corridor, and that was at the request of the village of North Palm Beach. Um, so that one will be removed um, from the list. So moving on, um, away from the US-1 corridor, there's a couple other projects I wanted to highlight real quick. Uh, we're seeking uh, study uh, funding for the tri-rail extension into Jupiter. Uh, we're also seeking some uh, program transit signal prioritization funds for the uh, Lake Worth Road uh, Enhanced Transit Project. Now, the last project I wanted to highlight here is the Atlantic Avenue Widening Project. Uh, we're accelerating uh, we want to accelerate the right-of-way and construction funds um, from Lyons Road to uh, Jog Road, as well as at the request of our board, actually modify the scope to uh, include separated bike lanes uh, throughout the entire corridor. Uh, the last item I have here is uh, for, uh, we're seeking to program four new projects as well as modify uh, three existing state road projects. And I put a table together for you all um, to take a look at that, um, but I'll briefly go through uh, each individual project that we, we're seeking to add to this priority list. Um, so starting off with the first one, Forest Hill Boulevard, uh, we're seeking to do a complete streets uh, and transit improvement project there. Uh, we're adding, uh, we're seeking to add roadway lighting, pedestrian lighting, uh, bus bay layover facility, as well as enhanced crosswalks at uh, signalized intersections uh, and green markings in conflict zones for bike lanes. Uh, on the Congress Avenue project, uh, again, we're seeking to do some, some improvements there for pedestrians, adding uh, pedestrian lighting, uh, as well as enhanced crosswalks at signalized intersections and bus stop amenities. Now, the third project on this list was actually a request from the city of Boca Raton. Um, they're seeking to replace a lot of their span wire uh, traffic signals uh, with mast arms, as well as some additional improvements for those uh, signalizations. The uh, fourth project on the list here is the State Road 7 project. Uh, we're seeking to modify a resurfacing project uh, to add a shared use pathway, as well as some sidewalks um, and add some pedestrian lighting and again, some green markings for conflict zones for bicyclists. Uh, the fifth project here, the Boynton Beach uh, Boulevard project is actually two modifications. So we're seeking to modify a, both a resurfacing project as well as an interchange capacity project uh, to add some wider sidewalks and separated bike lanes on both sides of the road. And the last project I have here on this table is uh, at the request of DOT, and it is the Indian Town Road at uh, Central Boulevard intersection project. They're seeking uh, PD&E funds uh, to study that area uh, to evaluate congestion mitigations uh, with minimal adverse impacts to pedestrians, cyclists, as well as the local businesses in that area. And that is all I have for the state road modification. So I'll actually pass it back over to Andrew uh, so he can cover uh, the LI. Thank you, Connor. So the, the coordinator for the local initiatives program is actually Jason Price, who's our, our transportation improvement program coordinator as well. Uh, he's the one who oversees this program and he works with the, the applicants and FDOT to get these products prioritized. But I'll be doing uh, that presentation today. He's out of, out of town. So this is roughly $22 million a year in federal funds from surface transportation authorization. And its purpose is to advance local uh, advanced lower cost, non-regionally significant transportation products identified by our communities through the application process. And these really go towards complete streets, uh, transit investments, uh, non-motorized infrastructure and freight efficiency. So this is a really, um, can really go towards a lot of different uh, types of projects. Uh, these are available for uh, on the federal aid eligible roadway network. So urban minor collector roadways are above, uh, really not, 
for use on smaller local roadways. Again, it's $22 million a year. Uh, and the funding reimbursement for this program is $5 million max per project uh, with a minimum of $250,000. And when these are prioritized into the transportation improvement program, design typically is prioritized in year three of the program and the construction is five years out. So the products that you'll see that are new here are anticipated to be uh, constructed in the new fifth year of the program. Some priority highlights, again, I'm not gonna be going through, just like Connor, all the products in the list. I'm just gonna give you the highlights for the newer ones. Uh, all the current ones are on track. Uh, the ones that are new for you this year uh, is to fund the prioritization of five that were unfunded last year uh, that were prioritized in the 2020 grant cycle. And that's around $12 million. So in the backup, that would be projects 20-1 all the way to 20-6. We were only able to prioritize one product last year from that list, and that was a tri-rail passenger rail cars as 20-2. So we're looking to prioritize those up front first before we uh, prioritize any of the new 2021 grant cycle projects. So for the 2021 grant cycle list, we have four applications total, uh, and we're looking to prioritize all four of those projects. You'll see in your backup that there are five projects, and the reason for that is Palm Beach County submitted uh, two projects on Prosperity Farms Road and for bike lanes. And uh, our staff here at TPA is recommending we combine those two products. Uh, when the cost estimates came back for the total eligible amount, the combined two products for those uh, was under $5 million cap. So we felt it was best to, to put those together as one product uh, because it didn't reach that $5 million cap and it's a longer overall product for bike lanes. And we thought it was a, a good investment there. So that's why you'll see it. Uh, we're recommending uh, the four products, four applications, and all four being funded. So the total amount requested for those four products is $14.5 million. And I wanted to make a note, uh, just like last year and every year, uh, the available funding is, is limited. Um, so it really, when it gets to after that, we're reviewing how much anticipated revenues are available and how much we have to spend. Uh, some of the lower ranked products may not be funded. On your screen now are the 2021 applications and I'll be going through them in detail as well. So you'll see the TPA scores, the applicant, the location, the type of project and the funding requested and then a status column. And I'll be going through them individually. So just like last year, we had SFRTA trial service submit for a passenger rail car, uh, $2.5 million. The next is Palm Beach County's Prosperity Farms Road, again, combined project to provide uh, designated bike lanes from North Lake Boulevard to Donald Ross Road, $4.9 million total. And I wanted to point out that you'll see the TPA scores here, uh, and there's a status column that says less than 25 points for the remaining projects here. That's really our, our, our total scores out of 100. Um, it was integrated into the, the scoring rubric or the, the guidelines to not score less than 25 points. And so that's why I'm flagging them here on the screen for you all today. Um, we're going to have to really assess that in our next time we, we move into how we're gonna uh, update our scoring system and the guidelines in the coming months here with you all and, and our other committees uh, to maybe adjust that because we typically don't see that high scores in the TPA program. Uh, the original intent of that, that less than 25 points was just to make sure that we're flagging these products to make sure they're still good projects and still meet our goals and objectives. So it's just one of those reminders for us to ensure that we're reviewing that more fully uh, when we're vetting these projects and, and ranking them. The next one is the Indian Trail Improvement District, and that's for three roadways, Temple Boulevard, Hall Boulevard, and 140th Ave North. And that's for unpaid pathways and the widened sidewalks out there, $2.5 million total. I wanted to point out on this one specifically is that we have a requirement for projects that abut single family residential properties that may have their driveways impacted, and may have other types of furnishings within the right-of-way, public right-of-way, such as fences or uh, landscapes. They can usually be pretty um, big impacts to those types of property owners. So that's why we require a higher level of public outreach and to show support. And in those thresholds, we have a threshold where you, uh, the feedback you receive from those property owners, if you don't get, uh, if you get higher than 25% who oppose, we wanted to make note of that. 
In this case, they did. It was actually 33% who opposed. They had a total of nine uh, property owners specifically on the, abutting those corridors uh, who, who turned in results, and three of them uh, opposed the project, six approved. Um, but again, that's like one metric there that we wanted to flag. Uh, we did see a lot of other uh, proponents of the project throughout the community. Uh, their governing board also supports the project and they had some community organizations also support the project. So uh, we felt confident in the project, they felt confident in the project. So we, we are keeping it on the list, but we wanted to flag it to, to make you all aware. And then lastly is West Palm Beach submitted for Mercer Avenue from Australian Ave to Center Park Boulevard. And that's for complete streets improvements, mostly bike lanes, a few sidewalk improvements in, in a, a couple of locations where it's missing and a few other pedestrian enhancements. So that's for $4.5 million. And so that rounds out the, the full list of projects that were new for the local initiatives uh, program. Next, we'll turn it over to Alyssa Frank, which you all are familiar with to go through transportation alternatives. It's weird to be presenting to all of you here. <laughs> um, my name is Alyssa Frank. If you don't know me, I'm the pedestrian bicycle coordinator and your VTPAC liaison. So um, I think we should all be pretty familiar with this program, but the Transportation Alternatives Program offers about $3.3 million annually. Um, and the purpose of this program is to help fund non-motorized infrastructure and safe routes to school projects. Um, projects can include complete streets, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, traffic calming, recreational trails, historic preservation, and safe routes to school. And eligible roadways for this include on and off federal aid eligible roadways, so both on and off of roadways. Um, again, the annual funding available is $3.3 million. And the federal reimbursement, um, the maximum for a project is $1 million. The minimum for a project is $250,000. And the timeline for this program is the funding for design in year one, and then funding for construction in year three. So uh, to highlight what's been going on with this program, all existing projects from last year are moving forward. Um, none are being held back. And we did receive four new applications this year. So all four are actually um, eligible and the total requested amount is 3.55 million. So just over that 3.3 million threshold. So I'm going to run through each of the four projects in the order that you all ranked them in. So first we're gonna start with Palm Beach Gardens project. It is a nine and a half foot separated two-way bicycle track on Burns Road from military trail to alternate A1A. The city of Palm Beach Gardens requested $1 million for this and the status is eligible. The second project on here is for lighting uh, on the El Rio Trail in Boca Raton. The limits for the lighting project are Glades Road to Yamato Road. Again, the city also requested a million dollars and it is eligible. Now, something to note for this project is that they only scored 21 points, so less than 25. However, you all did rank this project higher because of increased capacity to use trail in early morning and late evening hours when it's dark. Additionally, the scoring uh, um, did not reflect the college students' lower income. So, but it's still number two. The third project on here is uh, in Indian Trail Improvement District, and it is for a 10-foot shared use path on one side of the roadway and the other side of the roadway that will have an eight-foot pathway. Now, this is going to be done on two different roadways in the district. Um, the first is Great View Boulevard from Key Lime Boulevard to 60th Street. And the second is Key Lime Boulevard from Hall Boulevard to the M1 Canal. Again, uh, the district did request a million dollars for this project and it is eligible. And the fourth project on here was submitted by Wellington. This is for a 10 foot shared use path along the C8 Canal from Stribling Way to Forest Hill Boulevard. The requested funding amount for this was just over five and a half thousand dollars and it is also eligible. So with this, we are requesting a motion to recommend adoption of the fiscal year 23 through 27 list of priority projects. Okay, um, do we, where are we? Do we have any comments? Um, 
I don't have any uh, public comments at this time, um, but you do have a, ten, a few tent cards. So I have uh, John, David, and Sally, and hey, uh, Michael Owens. Okay. Good morning. Um, great to see everybody in person as well. Um, first, I wanna echo the, the comment that was made previously about the need to evaluate the scoring system not necessarily the scoring system itself, but why so many of those projects were scoring below the threshold. So, you know, is it the quality of the projects that we're getting in terms of applications? Um, you know, what could we do to, to get applications that may score higher to actually be submitted and, and shoot for that, you know, that funding effort? Um, or is it the scoring itself, the threshold and so forth? So, you know, the fact that four out of the five you know, scored below the threshold, you know, kind of raises a flag there. So, so I echo the concern that was expressed there. Um, also based upon some of the changes that you were talking about, I'm assuming that the exhibit A that was included in our backup is gonna be amended because you combine the two Palm Beach County projects together. And I'm guessing Palm Beach County is not getting a passenger rail car that you had in there, so. <laughs> um, and then also, you know, as usual, to be consistent with my uh, previous votes, I just want to put on the record that, you know, with the city's continued opposition to State Road 7, I will be voting against this item. It's nothing against the other projects in there, but um, because of that opposition, you know, I have to vote that way. So thank you. Thanks. David? I, I, I'm going to kind of echo the same exact thing that John said. Um, it, it seemed... Um, kind of strange that four out of the five uh, local initiative projects all scored below the threshold. Um, I, I understand that the scoring system is going to be revised uh, within the next year. So uh, is, is that typical? I mean, uh, I, I don't re remember last year. I mean, uh, were all the LI projects uh, scoring that low last year? Um, yes, they, they've been scoring in that 20s range sometimes they're getting the 30s the thing about the ally scoring system is that it incorporates um, a lot of our goals and objectives in there so it's well-rounded and so you know a product usually doesn't get into a much higher score up to 100 because it includes like freight efficiency um, it includes um, other types of travel time reliability there's points for transit there's points for pedestrian bicycle facilities right so um, there's a lot of different things that culminate into the scoring, whereas transportation alternatives is, is really geared towards non-motorized uh, projects. So that's why that one sort of always has more direct points for those projects, whereas this one includes non-motorized and all these other things. That's why it's it's sort of when we put this this 25 points threshold on there, you know, and we try to rate it out of 100, it's sort of it, it looks like it's a poor project, but really you know, it, it's still going and meeting our goals and objectives in these specific criteria, even though it, it doesn't arise to a hundred, right? So we shouldn't think about it as like the letter grade. Um, is, but, is it gonna change a lot, you think, uh, between this year and next year? Um, I don't foresee it changing rapidly or, 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 or a large amount. Um, I think we just need to re-examine whether we, we should have that 25 um, point threshold. Um, there's a few other things that we can tweak that would probably raise the score. Um, right now, we give a max uh, facility length of two miles. So you get maxed out on how much miles of actual pedestrian bicycle facilities you put out there. Um, and that's something that we may be able to just take that out. And that would raise points a little bit for longer projects. For example, uh, the, the, the Palm Beach County project uh, on Prosperity Farms is, is lar longer than two miles. And so, but they got maxed out at two miles of facilities. So things like that we can tweak and that would probably raise the scores a little bit for those types of projects, but we probably won't have a major overhaul of the program. It, it does kind of leave a little bit of room for people to, you know, bring in projects that actually cater to the goals and objectives and, you know, get tons of points. Um, all right. Thank you. Sally. Um. I do want to reiterate John's comments and, and David's comments about the um, con concern, and I'm glad that we will be looking at that later on. Um, I think it did affect our TA program to have a project um, that that would 
that satisfies as many goals and objectives towards uh, getting people out on their bikes and pedestrians safely as the Boca project and have it fall below the 25 point threshold. So I think that some of that is comes into the the way and the and the things where we offer a score, perhaps not being as fully rounding as the rounded as the TI program scoring. Um, I did have a, a question for staff, which is, can can you shed any light for me on what's going on with with North Palm Beach? I know that several years ago they did a um, with Treasure Coast, they did a, a project to sort of look at their that um, that main route through there with an idea towards improving things because they were, you know, having empty buildings and stuff like that. And and they withdrew their TA bridge project. And apparently now they've withdrawn a project that's looking at the the corridor beyond the bridge. So I'm just wondering if it's lack of public support objections to it or or what's happening that they're that they're not following through with these opportunities to get funding Hi, Connor Campbasso. Um, so I don't have a lot of background on that um, project specifically, but I, I'd be more than happy to follow up with an email uh, and get you the information about why they removed that project. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. So I have uh, Michael Owens followed by Fadi and Brian. Oh, I'm sorry, Sally, were you done? Okay, so I have Michael Owens, Fadi and Brian. Oh uh, yes, good morning. Uh, Thanks for the presentation. I just had a question um, regarding the state road modifications. I, um, the remarks about the Congress Avenue link that was going to be modified just kind of reminded me, and I was wondering, um, there's a, a link of Congress Avenue that, that I've always driven past uh, from Hypoluxo to Lantana, which I think is like a four lane divided uh, uh, roadway with, with turn lanes. I was wondering, is, that seems like the only section of Congress that, that's four lanes. It goes from you know, three, I'm sorry, six lanes south of Hypolux and then two, then four, and then back to three when you go north of Lantana. So I was just curious, as we were talking about the state road modifications, will that, I guess, I don't know, mile and a half segment ever be widened to, you know, a six lane uh, facility or just will it stay that way because of lack of right of way? I was just curious. Um, yeah, so I, again, that would be, more of a, a DOT question, but I can definitely follow up with them and, and figure that out for you. But I don't have that information right now at that time, at this time. Okay, that's fine. I just, I was just curious. Thank you. Okay, sure thing. Body. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my comment is about the scoring system. Um, I think the way we have it, again, it's a general comment. The way we have it is more like kind of serious instead of being parallel. For example, uh, something like a password will never score high because it only impact one area and not a lot of the areas on our scoring sheet. The same thing, there is a cap. I mean, some project would be excessively useful in one area, but it's only capped for a number of points. So this is something maybe we can consider to I mean, sometimes you can have a category if something greatly exceed the benefit in one area, maybe you can have additional point or bonus point or something just to be more reflective of the overall benefit of a system and not just kind of systematic serious one, just general comment. Okay, thanks Fadi. Brian. So this might be for Connor as well. Um, we seem to be striking out on lane repurposings on US-1, but could you shed any light on the Broadway repurposing, which used SunTrail dollars? Um, if you have any project information, if not, you could follow up by email. Sure, yeah. So with the Broadway project, we're, we're actually, I think we have a meeting, it might be next week um, with the city and the DOT um, to talk about that project. So there's a couple of concepts um, going on right now. Unfortunately, I, I don't think the lane repurposing 
part of that is moving forward. Um, again, we're still working through the design of it, but they still want to do some complete streets improvements and some some safety improvements along that corridor. Again, the design's not done yet, um, so they're still working through that. But there'll be more information uh, okay. coming soon. Great. So, yeah. Good luck with Lake Worth's project. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think, was that everybody, Margie? Um, I'm just double checking, I guess. Okay, I had one comment and it was related to um, the FDOT new project for Indian Town Road and Central Boulevard in Jupiter. I'm just curious, not specific to that, but how how does, you know, they're doing work, they're, they're FDOT is doing work in that area, but then they added this as a new project. How does that come about? I mean, what did they, what triggered that point of needing more information and wanting to do this PD and E study? Sure. So um, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the project that they're doing there um, currently, um, but this project's focusing mainly on improving capacity at that intersection. So if they're doing some sort of resurfacing project along there, um, that it would just be a completely separate project. This, um, this study, um, it, you know, the study is going to take a little bit over a year and then they're going to move forward into design several years later. And this is all getting programmed in the later years of the TIP. So um, realistically, this, the construction of this project is probably not going to happen for another eight, nine, 10 years. So um, if there was some needs that needed to be addressed um, in that area, DOT went and did them. But uh, for the capacity uh, improvement at that intersection. This is more of a, a long range kind of um, project, so. And then I saw, um, because we just did our um, bike walk safety audit uh, last month. Thank you, Joanna um, and Alyssa. And this was a, this was, this is an interesting area because it moves a lot of traffic, but, mm -hmm. but the, um, you know, you've got several factors in there you know, children and mothers walking their kids uh, to the community center. And so I saw the comment in here that TPA um, recommended alternative to be endorsed by TPA prior to additional funding, ad additional phases. So I just was trying to understand what that meant as well. Sure. So uh, in the original uh, proposal from DOT, they, they wanted to look at displaced left turns, um, and it was going to take uh, quite a bit of, of space. And um, we still have our questions about the safety for pedestrians and cyclists through displaced left turns. So what that statement is, um, is really addressing is that we want the DOT to look at some different alternatives um, for addressing capacity in that area. So we didn't want to fund design for a displaced left if we, if we didn't look at all the, all the alternatives. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Was there anybody else on this item? We're, do we have any public comments? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Okay. So we need a motion to recommend adoption of fiscal year 23 to 27 list of project priorities. Um, do we have a motion? I'll make the motion. David makes a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Michael, is that you? Yes, that is me. Okay, Michael Owens made the second. Um, we're going to do this by roll call? Yes. Okay, thanks, Margie. Um, so the motion on the floor is to recommend adoption of the fiscal year 23 to 27 list of project priorities as presented. Um, before I call the roll, just as a reminder to unmute your microphone on the base and then tended Michael if you can unmute while, when I call your name. Uh, Tracy Phelps? Yes. Bruce uh, Rosenzweig? Yes. Craig Pinder? Yes. Ted Goodenough? Yes. Joanna Peluso? Yes. Joanne Scaria? Yes. Uh, Fadi Nassar? Yes. Sally Channon? Yes. David Willock? Yes. Um, Casey, I'm sorry, I'm going to say your last name wrong, Casey. Prank, can you say it for me? Casey Pranken. Thank you. Casey yes. Pranken. Thank you. Uh, Yash Nagal. Yes. Michael Owens. Yes. Christian Santa Gonzalez. Yes. John Roach. No. Brian Ruscher. Yes. Stephanie Thoburn. Yes. It passes with one opposed. Okay, great. Next item.
what time is it? I think we're doing good. Um, the next item is the TPA's fiscal year 2022 strategic plan. And Valerie's gonna present. So yeah, I'll be presenting our draft fiscal year 22 strategic plan. But first, I'm going to give a few highlights from our, this past fiscal year that we just finished. Our fiscal year runs from July 1st through June 30th. So if you didn't pick up a copy of our annual report, um, please do. And I'm going to just briefly highlight some of its contents. So it does include a timeline of key things that happened over this past year, including adoption of our fiscal year 22 to 2026 transportation improvement program, uh, support of adoption of the regional transportation 2045 plan, renewed commitment to Vision Zero, um, Palm Tran broke ground on their new headquarters, which was a partially TPA funded project. So that was really exciting in Delray. We held a series of workshops um, and events including we hosted the Regional Safe Street Summit this past um, January. And we also received two agency designations that were the 2021 Best Workplaces for Commuters and Bicycle Friendly Business Silver designation. So some of the, the, the annual report is, is broken out in, across our six goals. So under Engage the Public, we reached over 2,000 participants in our um, meetings and, and activities that we did. We also highlight some of our planning efforts, including our most recent walk and bike safety audits that Alyssa has been doing a great job and Stephanie just mentioned <laughs> that we've been doing. Um, uh, an overview of our, of our TIP, the projects and the programs that we, we prioritized funds for and some of the construction highlights you can see there on the right, the Palm Trans had new headquarters in, in Delray. And some of the ways we collaborated with partners and um, some highlights from our events, as well as our fiscal year 21 strategic plan report card. So the strategic plan is not something required of us, but more of a best practice that we've been doing since 2016 um, to do a one year report plan of three to five specific strategic items that we want to achieve over the next year above and beyond what we already say we're gonna be doing in a two year unified planning work program across these six schools. So our TPA board met, um, our committee of our board met on June 21st and to, to review TPA staff's draft strategic plan actions, um, proposed actions, modifications, and they provided us feedback. And that's what we'll be presenting to our committees, to you guys today, and then to finally to the full board next week for adoption. I'm gonna highlight the changes from the past fiscal year uh, 21 strategic plan. The boxes in red are changes, um, and I'll, I'll explain those verbally, but um, if, on the screen you'll see crossed out are things deleted and underlined are things um, that are new text. So for goal one, engage the public, B, we changed the text to say instead of expand social media outreach, we said let's expand social media following and let's try to reach 4,000 followers on our social media account. We currently have a little over 3,000. So that's our new goal. We also changed, instead of the outcome being, let's do at least 10 social media posts per month. We said, let's actually reach 25,000 impressions per month as our goal. So not just what are we, how many times are we posting, but how many people are we reaching is our goal. For 1D, um, we had update video explaining the role of the TPA. That was a one-time thing and we, we did that. That's the video we saw earlier this, this morning. Um, and our new action that we're proposing there is to increase public awareness of the TPA. And the outcome for that would be to have at least 40 TPA related media stories. So we wanna be, um, you know, really be reaching more of our news outlets and more getting more awareness of the transportation planning process and, and projects that are happening. For 1E, we had uh, an action of provide live online access to our board meetings. And we did that um, through, the, through the pandemic. We provided now online access for people to be able to 
listen in and participate in our meetings. So our new action there is to present GPA initiatives to partner agencies and groups so, and provide at least 15 presentations. So we wanna be going out into the community, providing presentations to other local municipalities, to partner agencies, to raise awareness of what we do and get more, engage the public more. For goal two, plan the system, we added a new action to refine a countywide mobility vision and funding plan. The outcome would be a refined vision plan. We've been talking about this um, in our 2045 long range transportation plan. We, we identified several pedestrian and bicycle and transit desires, roadway desires. We wanna work with our partners to refine that vision um, for mobility and and refine the funding plan to make it happen. So that's something that we wanna get started on and, and continue um, that conversation with a, a refined vision plan. For conducting walk and bike safety field reviews, we wanna up that number from three to five locations. For uh, publishing the long range transportation implementation report, we're, we're doing this on an ongoing basis. So we, we strike through this because it's, we don't really consider it that strategic if it's a routine thing. And instead we said, let's implement and update our Vision Zero Action Plan, which is something that we adopted a couple of years ago. So we wanna update that and make sure we're implementing the actions identified in that plan. For 2D, we strike through Create Smart Palm Beach website to improve existing data. That's something that we, we achieved and it's live on our, our website. For 2E, create complete streets opportunities plan. We started getting down this path of, of this, of identifying complete streets opportunities. And then we realized that we need to update our complete streets design guidelines that we did in 2017. We created those a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and now things have changed. FDOT's design manual has changed. The, there's different things that have been, definitions that have been updated. So we said, let's revise and update our complete street design guidelines so that they're more current. And as part of that process, we'll identify complete streets opportunities based on that. So um, our outcome would be an updated complete street design guidelines. For goal three, we strike through notify partners of funding opportunities because again, this is more of an ongoing thing we're doing regardless in our in our in our liaison directors reports in our on our in our e news our our. If you guys get our newsletter and our social media, we're, we're, we're notifying folks of those on an ongoing basis when we see funding opportunities. So we strike through that as a strategic thing, item. For th um, the new 3A, we said, we, we do the LI and TA scoring. We revise those, we revisit those every year. It's more of an ongoing routine thing. We wanna create um, a new scoring system for a formal scoring system and process for our state road modifications. So we heard earlier this morning about the three funding parts, the transportation alternatives, the local initiatives, and then our state road modifications, which have been more of a, you know, projects that we see in our LRTP and we just kind of program them in, into our transportation pro, um, improvement program. However, we don't really have a scoring system for those projects we, in, to prioritize them. So we wanna work on creating a scoring system um, per FDOT guide, guidance and, and in line with our goals and objectives of our LRTP, but actually create more of a formal process. And through that for 3C, we wanna establish an application project uh, process for safety projects for, for these state roads. So, Basically, we want to encourage our local municipalities and create more of a formal process and prioritization scoring for projects that are on FDOT roadways. So if a local municipality has an idea for, for a project on a state roadway, then to apply to us for that and work, we'll work with FDOT and prioritize it based on the scoring. Um, we're kind of already doing this, but this is making it more formal. So, um, and then for 3D, we revised the language a bit to say, advocate for our adopted that we did adopt this past year legislative and policy positions let's advocate for those and 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 our outcomes would be amended laws and policies an example of this was um, one of our goals was to in, for the state to include bicycle safety education questions in the driver's license exam and that's actually something we'll hear more about later from Alyssa. but now there's going to be um 25 questions for bike related to bicycle safety um, as part of the driver's exam. So folks that are learning or getting their driver's license know how to, what are the rules, what are the laws, how to interact safely with bicyclists. For goal four, 
Um, we, we are always keeping tabs on upcoming projects that the county, that the state is doing, the local municipalities are doing, and we try to review those and identify, are there any safety improvements? Is there anything above and beyond that could be done and not as an opportunity for that project? And we engage with the local municipalities and stakeholders for that to influence that process. Our goal before was to do 20 projects a year, to evaluate 20 projects. We've upped that to 50 projects. So we want to be really proactive and, and try to tackle any opportunity that we can. Um, we strike through provide TPA priority project status report. That's again, an ongoing thing that we're doing. We don't really find that as a strategic thing. It's more of a routine thing that we're doing. Um, and then for 4D, monitor the collection of the SKETS tax revenue, manage lane revenue. We, and we strike through MCORs because that's not happening anymore. And we replace that with let's monitor, let's keep an eye on what are the what construction funds are being allocated for plant material? So landscaping, paying closer attention to that per Florida statutes. Goal five: collaborate with partners. We had collect head bike and activity counts. We are we're wanting to do that more of a, a routine thing. We're working with the county on on currently on deploying locations, and we want to evaluate other technologies that we can work with to collect more in head bike counts. So. We didn't find this to be like a strategic one-time thing. Um, so we strike through that for the new 5A is we added, it doesn't really change much, but we added assist local governments with transportation and mobility studies and plans. So before it said, let's assist local governments with transportation studies and plan, we added and mobility studies and plans. Um, and that was a tweak from our board sub committee that they requested that we add that language. For 5B, we just modified it to be more of a broader term. We said instead of conduct workshops, we said conduct events on topic of interest, which could include workshops or other types of events. Um, and we said, let's do at least four in the next year instead of three. And then uh, for 5C, we are almost done with creating a complete streets projects video. We hope to bring that to you for at our next meeting. But we want to, one of the things our, our board committee suggested was, why don't you guys create a mobility options video for people that live and visit Palm Beach County? Because people may not know all of the options to get around. They might just go to tri website or Palm Trans website or the city's um, trolley website or things, but what about creating a video that really highlights all the different ways that people can get around here in the county and how to do that? So that's something that we'd like to do and, and hopefully it'll be hopefully be helpful to promote multimodal transportation. And lastly, goal six, administer the agency. We before we had it as two separate item actions to provide training to our board members at conferences and 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 um for example, the MPOAC Institute local workshops. And then we also had it as a separate line item for provide training to TPA staff. We combined that into one line um, to provide training opportunities for TPA staff and our board members. And as a new item for 6B, we added modify um, TPA committees and to support TPA initiatives and revised operating procedures. This came up in our um, our board's discussion. They, they said, you know, they're, they're very alarmed by the amount of pedestrian and bicycle crashes and fatalities that are happening. Um, and they said, do we need to create a task force? Do we, um, what about creating a board subcommittee? And so they, they were asking about how do we, how can we ensure that our committees, our advisor committees and are, do we have the right membership and the right folks in the room? Um, whether that means maybe we need to add law enforcement, but we wanna look into that further and make sure that we're able to tackle um, our the TPA priorities. And really, we, we said we have a, a, a BT pack already that focuses on pedestrian and bicycle. So, you know, maybe we, we work with them and look at that. Maybe we need to add membership, a membership to this committee. Um, so that's something that they they suggested. And then um, the comprehensive annual financial report, that's um, we want to continue doing that and, and providing it for the past fiscal year, as well as ongoing summaries. So those are the, the tweaks for our strategic, our draft strategic plan for this new year. Thank you. Do we um, have any comments from the public? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Okay, so do we have any comments? Oh, David. I have a question. Um, 
since the internet uh, thing was crossed out, are you going to continue to provide um, the meetings? Yes. Internet? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because well, almost nothing good came out of the pandemic, but that was a good thing. Yeah. yeah to expand uh, thing. expand opportunities for people to listen in and participate. Yes. All right. Thank you. Body. I think it's a comment uh, I made before, but I think it's worth kind of reiterating. Uh, I know the TPA, I mean, you have wonderful staff and you're doing an amazing job, but I think we are right now at, at the point where we have unique opportunity. I know uh, the, the TPA is making big plans for transit for the future. And right now we're in the process of updating the regional model and we have a new consultant there's probably a new tool, a new kind of software they're gonna be using. And uh, there's a lot of changes from the pandemic and after, I mean, there is the electric bike, the electric scooter, there's all kinds of things that may be uh, affecting mobility for the future. So I really strongly believe there is an opportunity right now for the GPA since Palm Beach will benefit the most uh, to invest in enhancing the Serpa model to be more reflective about all the various options you wanna evaluate for transit. Uh, I mean, the way transit transit is estimated, it's a complicated uh, nested logic with these utility functions that require a lot of parameters. It's good to get some of these parameters from local conditions. You may wanna, I don't know, maybe operate a free shuttle between military or Kichobi downtown just to derive some of the data that you need. Uh, you are at the point where the regional model is being completely revamped. You need the data to plan for the future of transit. Whether you believe vision is important, the federal highway to provide any fund, they're gonna look at ridership, at how you're you know, addressing uh, all the parameters, you know, from pedestrian to bicycling to, 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 to transit. So, even if there's something gonna come down the road, but I think this year and next year will be really important for you to look into this one and maybe spend more effort in getting the data you need for proper, uh, so the model will be able to give you the information you need for the future. Thank you. Madam Chair, I do have that Ted raise his hand and then um, John, Joanna and Brian. Uh, Ted, you can go ahead. Sure. Okay. Um, you mentioned the video that we saw earlier, and I was wondering, did it have closed caption or an ASL interpreter uh, in it? And um, are you considering with the upcoming videos doing a closed captioning or an ASL interpreter and audio description? Because I realized after we saw the video, it wasn't just the person's face, there was probably video of parts of the county. That's a great comment, Ted. Yes, we are working with our the folks that created the video to provide that and, and we'll do that for the future videos as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Um, Joanna. So I, um, I really was, uh, it's a comment as well about um, changing the operating procedures as part of the strategic plan. I um, watched the governing board meeting where they, they mentioned doing another subcommittee, which nobody needs. Um, so I'm really excited to see that there's gonna be like exploring how um, the committees that we already have, like this one can contribute to that and really look very strategically at um, the increased pedestrian fatalities. And I think, you know, one thing that's like clear with the work that you're doing around engaging the public and collaborating with partners is that those two also play a very important role in moderating, uh, modifying the operating procedures or the committee roles to kind of work towards more of that public on the ground engagement, um, you know, that can get ahead of some of these issues that uh, I think that the community, the ones that are, I mean, we saw it right on our walk on it you know, hearing directly from those that are using our streets are an important part of that. So I just uh, encourage that the uh, modifying the TPA committees to be more strategically aligned with engaging the public and collaborating with partners. 
John. John. Thank you. Um, just have one comment and then um, a question for goal 3A. You had in there about creating the state road modification scoring system, obviously in light of our you know, comments on the previous item. I think you hear a lot of concern from this group and some of your other committees as well with regards to the scoring system. So, you know, I hope as that scoring system is developed that you, you know, integrate the comments that you hear from us and include us in that development of that system. And you would, that was in place of, you know, where you had the, the LITA scoring system cross out, you know, there still may be some need for some modifications to those. So, um again that's in light of the the conversation on the previous item so i don't want to lose sight of that you know by eliminating it from the priority or from the strategic plan but um certainly hopefully that's something we can continue to to evolve over the time um the other comment was i was curious as to goal 6b you had in there modify the tpa committees to support the initiatives and i'm just curious have you guys what does modification mean is that membership of the committees is that you know things that come before the committees has there been any discussion as to what that would entail um and and just to the the previous comment for the we we do continue to we do plan to continue to look at the ta and li scoring every year but just wasn't like a one-time thing the srm is more of a one-time let's create a formal process for this Understood. um for the 6b and that's following up on joanna's comment it was a a request from our board to are we, do we have the right makeup of our committees do we have everybody we need to be helping us advise um, and really focusing on this problem of pedestrian bicycle fatalities that we're having so it's more of um, you know who do we need to look at do we need more people um, who represented in this conversation you know for example law enforcement do we need someone versus creating a new a new committee for just bike ped safety, we have a committee, you know, so, um, and it was also discussed, maybe the board would like to have a, a subcommittee. I don't know if that will actually, you know, happen, but because they only meet, um, they don't meet every month of the year. So it's, and, and as Nick likes to say, there's, there's people lose attention after two hours. So we only get <laughs> um, so much. So, you know, they want to be more involved in, in, the, in that process too, taking more of a leadership role and how do we address this? How do we make vision zero actually happen? You know, so okay. we'll see. It's to, it's kind of an initial thought and action that we have to explore further. Okay, thank you. Were there any other comments? Margie, I have a comment. Oh, um, Brian. Brian. And I'm sorry, Tracy as well. Um, Joanna kind of took the wind out of my sails with her comments. Thank you, Joanna. Um, I just wanted to also reiterate, I haven't spoken to a single community uh, that's especially east of you know 95 coastal communities that hasn't wanted to do a mobility plan. So I think the TPA support for those initiatives are going to be really important. You'll probably see that number expand into the future. Um, and then also, I think that there's a, a lot of potential to have the board involved with the TPA's production of the you know public information and the videos that go out. So maybe member community jurisdictional interviews. If we know of stakeholders in the community, I think it'd be good to utilize the board for those purposes, if not directly in the videos. So thank you for that. I appreciate it and look forward to this passing. Tracy? Uh, you mentioned uh, doing some uh, on-site uh, pedestrian and bicycle reviews. Um, I think uh, we at the city of Boca, we're gonna start testing uh, motion pedestrian detection this year, um, hopefully. Uh, had several vendors in and hopefully to install uh, at one or two locations and test it versus the push buttons because we are finding a lot of people don't push for the push the pad buttons that might be an intersection that um, you could uh, one of those intersections uh, we could work together and that'd be great yeah we we definitely want to be in, involved and in, in the loop of any pedestrian detection but also um, happy to help with any walk bike safety audits and Alyssa's our our point person for that so she's she's going out and doing another one tomorrow so definitely reach out to her with with any interest um, to coordinate one of those and yeah, we also have a large population uh, that isn't allowed to push the push buttons during certain times of the year um, so uh, we're definitely looking at that and we'd love to work with you on one on whatever location we decide to put it in on 
great. Thank you. Um, I have one comment and it's related to 6B. Um, what will be the process of determining how um, the modified TPA committees are going to be addressed? Is that gonna be coming from the TPA? Is that something that staff will recommend or will it be brought to our board to make a recommendation on what, and then pushed up or how, how is the process going to, how do you see the process? Um, we're not quite a hundred percent sure yet, but the mo I mean, for sure we would be bringing, if staff recommends it, we would be bringing the, the, this to each of our advisory committees and then to the board for their review and input modifications and, and final adoption. Um, whether or not the board decides that they want to do a sub committee to talk about it more then that might happen too before we go through that process but regardless we would bring it to each of our advisory committees for review and, and input i just i just think that this board has has a lot of input mm -hmm. on how we reach a community and how we touch our own communities so you know you're starting to hear it just from this little discussion so maybe if it's on an agenda to give you ideas sure. about how to move forward. And I don't wanna get into all that today because that's not really for up for discussion. It's more on the strategic planning. Um, and if we don't have any anything else, do we have a motion? Motion to approve the 2022 fiscal year strategic plan. It's a motion by Brian, do I have a second? I'll second. I'll second. Tracy, second? Yes. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. And Margie, are you going to do roll call? Yes. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, um, the motion on the floor is to recommend adoption of the fiscal year 22 strategic plan as presented. And I had a motion by Brian and a second by Tracy. Um, and then when I call your name, please state uh, yes or no. And then uh, remember to unmute your microphone. Uh, Tracy Phelps. Yes. Uh, Brian Rosenzweig. I'm sorry, Bruce. It's okay. Yes. Too many B names, you guys. Uh, Craig Pinder. Yes. Uh, Ted Goodenough. Yes. Uh, Joanna Peluso. Yes. Joanne Scaria. Yes. Fadi Nassar. Yes. Sally Channon. Yes. Uh, David Willock. Yes. Uh, Casey Prinkin. Yes. Yash Nagal. Yes. Michael Owens. Yes. Uh, Christian Santa Gonzalez. Yes. John Roach. Yes. Brian Ruscher. Yes. And Stephanie Thoburn. Yes. It passes unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. So we're on to information items. By Alyssa, our pet and bicycle coordinator. Okay. I'm gonna come up here to present this one. <laughs> okay, so I am here today to present our understanding of Senate Bill 950, which is for bicyclist safety. So, this bill um, did a couple of things. It first adds a formal definition for bicycle facilities and separated bicycle or bicycle lanes and separated bicycle lanes. Um, it also revises the requirements for four different movements on the roadway, which I will go through um, each of those individually. And then it requires FDOT to have an annual awareness and safety campaign in addition to adding 25 questions to the driver's license exam, which is a big deal for us. We're very excited about that. And all of this went into effect on July 1st, 2021. So first for the definitions, um, these are new per section 316.003 of Florida statutes. The formal definition now of a bicycle lane is any portion of a roadway which is designated by pavement markings and signs for preferential or exclusive use by bicycles. Now, a separated bicycle lane is a bicycle lane that is separated from motor vehicle traffic with a physical barrier. So in this instance, um, on the screen, 
It is a bicycle lane with a six foot curb and landscaped buffer. And that is a separated bicycle lane where a regular bicycle lane is just the two white stripes with a space to ride in between with the marked uh, bicycle designation in between those two lines. So now we're going to move into the four different movements on the roadway that I had previously mentioned. The first is for vehicles overtaking bicycles and e-bikes. So this actually changed Florida statute 316.0875, which was a law on no passing zones to allow the motorists to safely and briefly drive to the left of the center line of a roadway to pass a cyclist as long as there is a three feet uh, at least or minimum of three feet of passing distance. So I'm going to describe the graphics we see on the screen here. It is a two lane roadway. Um, there is a vehicle and there are two bicyclists riding along the right edge of the roadway in that uh, or in front of that vehicle. On the other side of the roadway, on the other side of that center line, there is an oncoming vehicle. Now the vehicle that is behind the two bicyclists is required to actually ma maintain a safe distance behind that cyclist until they are able to pass and that oncoming traffic is gone. Now, on the other side of the screen, what we see is that that oncoming traffic is gone and that vehicle is able to cross that center line and until uh, stay on that side until they are able to get back in front of those cyclists. So safely and briefly are the keywords here. The next movement, um, this change in the legislature actually helps to prevent right hook crashes. So here we're saying that if there is a turning vehicle, um, a car turning, making a right hand turn, they are not actually able to make that right hand turn. If there is a bicyclist that is 20 feet or less away from that turn. So if that vehicle is at that stop up stop bar and the cyclist is behind them they are not able to actually continue with that movement until that cyclist is uh not or either further behind or has surpassed them and this is because if the speed of the cyclist will actually have them if they're less than 20 feet hit that vehicle as that car is turning so it's okay for that car to make that right turn if the cyclist is greater than 10 feet or 20 feet away from that intersection but not less than 20 feet so the next movement is for cyclists that are making a left turn. So again, two graphics on this slide. The first graphic shows that if there is a cyclist making a left turn in a left turn lane, they are legally able to take that entire left turn lane to make that movement. The other side of the screen shows that after that, via, or that bicyclist has taken that lane and they are moving through that intersection, they are actually, um, they should stay towards the right edge of the roadway after crossing through that intersection. So you cross through that intersection, there are multiple lanes, you're not as a cyclist riding in that left lane, you're riding in that right lane as close to the uh, edge of that roadway as possible. Now we're going to talk about riding single file. So when there is no bicycle lane, a bicyclist must ride as close as practicable to the right hand curb or edge of the roadway. So if there is no bicycle lane, the cyclist is able to ride in the roadway. Now, if there is a bicycle lane, the cyclist is required to ride in the bicycle lane. If the bicycle lane is too narrow to accommodate to abreast, they must ride in a single file line. So on this page, we see, um, or on this slide, we see a two lane road with bicycle lanes. We have two cyclists riding single file in the bicycle lane. And then there's also a graphic in the top left corner of this slide that shows a bicycle lane with three cyclists not entirely riding in it. Um, so that is an example of what not to do. We cannot ride more than two abreast. And if we're riding in the bicycle lane, we need to stay in the bicycle lane. And again, if there is a bicycle lane, that's where we have to ride. Now, if it's a wider bicycle lane and can accommodate two abreast, that is okay. Um, two abreast is the maximum amount of people to ride next to each other on a roadway. Uh, or adjacent or roadway adjacent facility. And again, we see that graphic with the three cyclists in the bike lane, and that is what not to do. We are not doing that, it's too maximum and both need to fit within those striped lines. 
Now, where can you ride more than two abreast? Cyclists may only ride more than two abreast if riding on a bicycle path. So the graphic we see on the screen now is actually the El Rio Trail in Boca Raton. It is not along the roadway and is a designated bicycle facility that is not a roadway facility. So it is okay to ride more than two abreast. So again, we see the El Rio Trail and there are five cyclists, uh, four in a group and one is not. That is okay. Now for movements where a bicycle is overtaking another bicycle in the bike lane, um, let's say you're riding in the bike lane, there is a slower bicyclist in front of you and you need to pass them, that is okay, but you're only able to do that when there is no traffic, um, you're not going to impede on any traffic, you are able to cross into the traffic lane and then pass that cyclist, however, after you pass that cyclist, you need to get back into that bicycle lane, and as a reminder, you need to ride single file if the bicycle lane is not wide enough to accommodate two abreast. So this is a new one also, um, cycling groups at stop signs. So before we get into this, just as a reminder, all cyclists are required to, and expected to actually follow all traffic laws, um, stopping at stop signs, following all traffic signals, all of that. So at a stop sign, cyclists must come to a stop. Everyone in the group must come to a complete stop. Now, after that complete stop, Group, a group of cyclists of 10 or less are permitted to travel through that stop sign. So the cars must wait for that group of, again, 10 or less cyclists to go through the stop sign and then the motor vehicle can make their movement. And then another group of 10 or less can make a movement through the stop sign. So again, traveling in groups of 10 or less, but 12 people cannot travel through a stop sign. So if you're a group of 12 cyclists or 13, divide up or 10 and three, however you wanna do it, but you cannot do a group larger than 10. And so as a reminder, this does also require FDOT to launch a safety campaign. So a few examples we've seen in the past include red out for rail safety, don't text and drive, alert today alive tomorrow, driving down fatalities. When we are aware of the safety campaign that they are launching, we are going to share it. We are going to you know, post it and make sure everyone's aware of it because this is super important. And lastly, we just wanted to touch on that this does also add 25 bicycle safety questions onto the driver's license uh, test, which is great. This is one of our strategic plan items from last year. And this was also one of our legislative policies that we were trying to push. So it's great news to see that this is now a requirement. And if anyone wants any more information on this, please reach out to me or visit the website. Um, we do have this linked in the agenda as well as I can share this with whoever would like to have the actual language for the legislator, le legislature. So. Great, thank you. Um, I do, ha do we have um, any questions? Madam Just Chair, before you move forward, I'm sorry, there are no public comments on thank this Thank you, Margie, for keeping us on track. Just a quick question related to the driver's license test. Um, so the, the test as it stands now is 50 questions. So half of the questions are gonna be related to bicycle safety on the driver's license exam. So I'm waiting to see a copy of the exam, but it is actually, it's a bank of 25 questions okay. and they're gonna be interchanged. That's what I was, yes. yeah, I was wondering about, thank you. But I'm waiting to hopefully get a list of those 25 questions. <laughs> thank you. Um, Craig? Yes, um, another question about the driver's license test. How has there been any thought given to reaching those who are already licensed drivers? I know that you said that there will be like an outreach campaign going on, but what about most people who don't, or at least they're difficult to reach through those campaigns? I can get back to you on that. I believe right now the plan is if people have already had their, or you know, we all have our licenses, not all of us, but you know, um, we're not going to be required to retake that test, but that's why they're doing the educational campaign. So that's why we'll make sure to blast it out. Bruce. Thanks. Um, I think it's important to emphasize the term where practicable when talking about um, cyclists riding in the bike lanes and emphasize the fact that unlined, unnoted uh, rights of way are not bike lanes. Um, unfortunately, the general populace finds uh, shoulders of the road and bike lanes, a uh, convenient repository for whatever trash they care to toss out of their car windows and construction sites seem to be very lax in uh, 
maintaining uh, the cleanliness, let's say, of their sites. There's uh, innumerable uh, incidents of uh, cyclists going down, uh, hitting patches of sand that uh, flow out from some of these construction sites. Um, not exactly sure how to go about correcting those things. We've called a number of times to the municipalities to have the uh, contractors uh, that are responsible for this. And uh, some weeks after lodging complaints, something gets done and then it goes back to the same old, same old. Um, perhaps part of this uh, outreach figured into the, uh, the, new, the new plan for the, uh, for this committee or for the TPA uh, might address something like that. Definitely, and I just do also wanna point out very quickly that we do have our online comment map for any locations that you might find when you're riding that is a hazard. You are more than welcome to go on there and make sure that we are aware of that so we can direct that to the appropriate people. Uh, in addition, um, the, uh, the codified rule about only 10 uh, people going through a stop sign after fully stopping. All I can say is uh, in my experience, and I ride uh, anywhere from Palmetto Park Road up to the Palm Beach Inlet, which is a good portion of, uh, of the county, uh, there are four or five groups that you've, you'd find it hard pressed to uh, impress on the, the, you know, the legality or illegality of what they're doing. Uh, again, outreach to law enforcement to uh, quote unquote, round them up and maybe educate, educate them in, uh, in soft tones, uh, <laughs> not necessarily citations uh, might help. We've tried that. Uh, as uh, board members of the, the Boca Bike Club um, with uh, unimpressive uh, results. Maybe this board has uh, a bit more influence. John? Just one item, if you can clarify, the stain completely within the lane, that's a designated striped marked bike lane correct because i think there's a lot of kind of what bruce was talking about with regards to the shoulder there's a lot of instances where we have a wider shoulder you know there's a lot of sections of a1a and so forth that are wide shoulders they're not designated bike lanes however the motors doesn't think that you know they think that it is a bike lane and you know they yell at you to stay within it and so forth so um so i just want a clarification of the Stain completely, you know, right of the line is for the designated bike lanes, not the wide shoulders. Yes. So to clarify <clears throat> for designated bike lanes, uh, paved shoulders, you're still, that's not a designated facility. So if there is a paved shoulder, you're still required to ride in the travel lane. Okay. So, and that will be hopefully a part of the outreach and education material, but we'll definitely focus on that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Sally. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the graphics. I read through that and that was the first thing I had to do was pull out a sheet of paper <laughs> to understand it. So I appreciate that. Um, I did have a question. It, it's really kind of following up on this idea um, about the designated lanes. I know that those standards for what can be for, for like the FDOT standard for what's considered a bike lane width has changed over the years. Um, what controls um, like a, a municipality or an area from, I, I mean, I know that if it's marked as a, a lane that uh, that encumbers cleaning it a certain number of times a year or whatever, um, but, but what would prevent a local municipality from designating basically a substandard ride shoulder as a bike lane for the purpose of, of requiring cyclists to be right of that white line? Is, is there some general thing that applies that says, if you're gonna designate something, it's got to be X feet wide? Yes, so um, although this Florida statute does not outline that, um, there are um, other design guidelines and documents that do mandate the width or required widths of facilities. So although FDOT does have their own design, guideline, design guidelines, um, other municipalities, the county has their own uh, for width of facilities, but you cannot um, actually designate a, 
any roadway to have a designated bicycle facility if it's less than four feet of paved material. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I could just say it's the Florida Green Book typically would prevent municipalities. You have to follow those standards. So I would check out, there's a specific section on bicycle facilities. It's really helpful to go through and do a read. There's actually a 2018 draft, um, which has some interesting components in it. I would recommend the committee going and looking at it. It still hasn't been adopted three years later. I think it's because of some of the sp specifics related to bicycle requirements and the, the clear areas for pedestrians. So I'd recommend going and reading the 2018 draft of the Florida Green Book and the 2016 established and adopted version as well. I have Ted with his hand raised. Okay, and then John. I appreciate your describing the, the graphics. Um, makes a great big difference for me. By, uh, my question is, in when there's multiple left-hand turn lanes, are the bicycles required to be in the right-hand uh, or the furthest to the right left-hand turn lane? It looks like that was a popular question. <laughs> um, yeah, so there was no language in this, but if you are required to get in that outside lane after you make that movement, it, you would stay in that right-hand turn lane or the left turn lane, but the outside most turn lane. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sally, I just want to make sure, did you have additional comments? Okay, then I have nobody else. Um, thank you for the illustrative graphics that you provided. Um, I know one thing I'm going to take from this is one I'd like your PowerPoint because I'd like to share it with the police department um, because it's not just the language there, you know, the graphics speak volumes. Um, and then also I will see what we can do as our municipality and our, our website on how we can put it on our website or create a link to yours because in Jupiter we have ocean A1A and we have a significant problem with um, conflicts with users because they all want to be on the beach and we have bicyclists who ride you know not just two abreast but sometimes five abreast and then we also have you know joggers in the bicycle lanes and um everybody wanting to be along the, the beach side. So, um, and then you have people who just wanna go out for a Sunday ride. So we have lots of um, conflicts that we need to address and it continues to be an issue because we don't have, we have very limited room along the beachfront. So um, I would encourage everyone to see what we as a group can do individually to help spread the word on this because I think it's very valuable and I and and whoever lobbied to get this in there, thank you. Um, it was it's long overdue. So that I think, uh, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, oh, Tracy oh. does. Uh, was that uh, those slides in our package PowerPoint? So they were not, but I will definitely share that with the group after this. Yes. So I no think worries. we all need it. Yeah, Madam Chair, as a reminder, we do post all of our presentations and the meeting audio on our website. Okay. Following the meeting. Is it separated or one? It is. PDF? But um, when we send a follow up email after this meeting, we'll make sure to send you the direct link. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So do we, Tracy? Okay. Um, do we have anything else um, on this? We don't need a motion on this. Next item is the administrative items. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And I do have one noted change um, for 4D. We did have the wrong meeting listed. The next BTPAC meeting is actually September 2nd. Okay. Kara. Yeah, and there was an error, error on your chair's copy. Our apologies. So it's not Kara. No, uh, it should be Stephanie on your script. <laughs> okay, Stephanie, let me read this. Um, so, so we have the, the summary points from the governing board from the June 17th meeting. Um, and these are just informational items and no staff presentation. Um, are there any comments on the items in the agenda? 
Uh, no, Madam Chair. And uh, just as a reminder, the annual report um, that's listed as an administrative item, we did uh, provide a hard copy. And for the members not present in person, we will be mailing a copy. Great. This is nice. This is very nice. Your new, your new community relations team is. Yes, we do have a, a lot great of work to do. Team. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you. All right. So our next meeting is September 2nd. No August meeting. So go on vacation, everyone. And since I'm not Kara, our, um, the next TAC meeting is scheduled for September. It's, not it's TAC. That's no, TAC. again, I apologize okay. for the error. See, the I next follow BT, directions I so know well. you do. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. The next BT FAC meeting is September 2nd. September 2nd. I got that one. Everybody have a good summer off. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank we you. did it again. Take care, everyone. See you in September. <laughs>